Hello there, you're watching the Salem Broadcasting Corporation SLBC. Welcome to News Hour. I am Adam Asila. Top stories in this edition of our news. Freetown Skyline has a new Freetown City Hall administrative complex worth over 50 million United States dollars. The National Civil Registration Authority says it is in an advanced stage to commence the issuance of national identification cards. Ministry of Health provides medical equipment to the Southern Psychiatric Hospital in Kise. And two men work up free in the murder trial of the 19-year-old Anna Bokeri. All those stories are lined up in this edition of our news, but as always, we'll start first with our corona preventive message. message will now go for the news in detail. The new building of the Freedom City Council has been opened in Freetown. The edifice is worth over 50 million United States dollars and will add beauty in Freetown sky. The modern infrastructure with 15 floors, office spaces and car parks among other facilities will help generate revenue for the council and mitigate traffic congestion in the center part of Freetown. Minister of Local Government Tamba Lamina said the structure will increase efficiency in public service delivery. Joseph Turi with Mr. Samani. On behalf of His Excellency the President, uh, retired Brigadier Julius Parabio, I declare this wonderful edifice, uh, Freetown City, uh, Free uh, City Hall, the administrative building of the FCC, open. Oh. Hey. The official opening of this magnificent building was a plus to strengthening the bilateral relationship between Sierra Leone and South Korea Republic. The state of art edifice is said to be a building of tremendous opportunities to improve efficiency and effectiveness for public servants. Minister of Local Government Tamba Lamina called for effective use of the building. The ministry will accord its support right through. As you know, we always do, not only for FCC, but also for all local councils throughout the, the nation, including providing improved salaries, supporting heightened cooperation among various stakeholders, which is critical to transforming governance at the local level. The mayor of Freetown, Yvonne Akisoya, described this latest development as one that connects with the Transform Freetown Initiative. The building offers tremendous opportunities to enhance the work of council with the provision of additional space and faci technical facilities that will improve efficiency and effectiveness. At the same time, the provision of amenities such as the auditorium and the library will support the revival of arts and culture in our city. This transformation will not stand alone. For the South Korean ambassador Lee Intei, the venture by their government is one among many that would strengthen the bond between the two countries. Korea is so proud to celebrate the opening of new city hall with the people of Freetown. Congratulations to all people of the Freetown, especially to the mayor of Freetown. It is my hope that the new Randomark City Hall complex will become the uh, pattern of the Freetown and a shining beacon of our eternal friendship. Deputy Minister of Finance 1, Dr. Patricia Lavalli, underscored government's unwavering commitment during the project, stating 
nearly two million dollars was provided the deputy minister of foreign affairs and international cooperation solomon jamiru emphasized on the solidarity that both countries have stood for in trade and medicine among others it could be recalled that the old city hall was destroyed during the war and this has had adverse effects on administrative social and entertainment activities in the capital this building will bring great relief to these challenges this over 50 million dollars ultra modern building here in freetown is a blessing to the public service of sierra leone it has 15 floors guest rooms and other facilities recently we've seen that mds have also shown interest to accommodate this particular building because the issue of accommodation has been a serious constraint for some government ministries departments and agencies however there are some with the opinion that the issue of maintenance should be highly upheld as that has been a serious challenge for many public buildings over the years for slbc i am joseph Ture, reporting from the central part of freetown all year before the freedom city hall administrative complex was opened our reporter Cynthia Kamara went to see how work was progressing, the offices to be occupied and the auditorium. It's could be recalled that the project was financed by the Economic Development Corporation Fund. During the tour, an engineer first showed the team photos of the development of the building since the time of Tony of the Sword. The building, which is 15 story, has a functional lift. The first floor has a city hall, exhibition, staff lounge, whilst the second floor houses the computer lab. The auditorium, which is located at the fourth floor, has a 500 capacity accommodation. The backstage has musical sets, loudspeakers, mics and safety lights for protection in the absence of electricity. The building also has a spacious councillor well, procurement, monitoring, evaluation and other service offices. The 13th floor is to be occupied by the mayor and deputy mayor. The 14th floor has 10 guest rooms and the 15th floor has an outstanding sky lounge, bar, staff restroom and beautiful sea view. The building is disability friendly with a special parking space for wheelchairs and a spacious car park. Each floor has toilet facilities and safety equipment. Minister of Local Government Stamba Lamina lauded the Freetown City Council and the Korean contractors for the job well done describing the building as iconic and first of its kind in the country. He spoke on the plans they have for occupants of the building. Uh, what transpires, uh, it's still on paper, and as I've been speaking to the mayor, they are still considering financial options because a loan was taken and that loan needs to be paid. Whatever uh, is proposed, by Freetown City Council and of course through the government overseeing will be what will happen to this building. But at this stage, uh, we're very happy with work and the progress of the work. We're here, the completion of the project, uh, it's in sight. Mayor of Freetown, Yvonne Akesoya, said the purpose of the building is to serve Freetown residents and she stressed on the need for maintenance culture. It's very much open to um, the public. We're going to be, as the Minister said, we've been, we're working on the financial model as FCC. We've put a team together, we've been working for some time, we're working with a facility management consultant to ensure that we are able to estimate and project all the running costs of the building, from electricity to water to cleaning. Maintenance and um, management also comes with the decisions you make about usage. So part of that process is looking at the best use of, the, of this facility. The building will be opened officially on November this year. For SLBC News, Cynthia Kamara. Meanwhile, road traffic and congestion is a significant hindrance to the economic activity. The lack of secured parking space for staff and customers is also a common complaint by many businesses. Many vehicle owners are in the habit of parking and deserting their cars on the street for hours and sometimes days or weeks 
without even taking into consideration the discomfort of both vehicles and pedestrians. Well, the parking space of the newly constructed Freetown Administrative Building salvaged the situation. Well, let's share Maya Masuma as she's been finding out. This is Freetown, a small but very busy city on the west coast of Africa. As in other cities, hundreds of vehicles flood the city center every day, where most business and other transactions are done. One big sector where they bring economics to the country. This sector is one that generates income in our country. And it will help improve on the socioeconomic standards. And if we have free flow of traffic, we are in the movement of people is faster, then there will be more improvement in the country's revenue generation. Meaning the movement of people and be fast, what we this believe is save more money and this partners. to bring more economy in the country. That is what we believe as a transport sector or transport partners. But there is very limited or no organized parking location. Hence, the narrow roads have been made narrower to either one-way traffic or have totally been cut off from vehicular passage. That's because there is hardly any building within this central business district area with its own car park space. Some vehicle owners are even making the situation worse by abandoning their automobiles on busy streets for hours and sometimes days or weeks, ignoring the discomforts to other road users, especially pedestrians. These men have taken advantage of the situation to generate income for themselves. They are their own employers in this regard. We don't have a normal price. Some vehicle owners will give us 10,000, some will give us 5,000, and others will even give us 2,000, and we still appreciate it. We do not hire people. Where we have placed our tires is vacant, so we have occupied those places. We are doing this business because we are talking this demarcated space come in the form of an annual subscription with a fee of about 2 million loans to the city. President Bill had acknowledged the inconveniences of such congestion to many people. Traffic congestion, he had said, diminishes productivity increases the cost of commuting through increased fuel and operating cost as well as having environmental and health implications. This problem was why he recently launched a $50 million urban transport improvement project supported by the World Bank. We can make change the transport sector. When the project will bring a change in the transport sector, it will, change. it will give us the opportunity to change our system. system within the city, especially around the market places. Like with the parking system, market, like we travel move, we go to London. This is a 15-story building which is still under construction to be completed by November this year. Attached to it is a six-story car park space, which could however accommodate only about 100 vehicles, a novelty in Sierra Leone. The city engineer Aruna Sowa said any use of it by members of the public, other than staff and visitors of the council, will be paid for. Some of these cities in the central business district, district have been crying for spaces like the, the Bank of Sierra Leone, the local Bank, and other public offices. They've been crying, they've been coming to the city council to make sure we give them out plots, probably two billion or so. So if we have a space that can accommodate up to one hundred, left, I'm sure that will help in minimizing in one way or the other. Previously, we had, we, we, are, we have a unit called a street parking unit. We had a standard, and then I think we have to revisit just a standard, and it, it is going to be an affordable amount that probably everybody who comes around now will be able to pay. Even though this situation is very disturbing, it has become a means of surviving for many youth within the municipality. Well, the uh, public relations service of the Federal City Council 
Koma Hassan Kamara spoke earlier on during a news art to my colleague Sonia Jaffo about this newly constructed edifice. This was uh, support from the South Korean government and um, in partnership with the Australian government. And the money and the cost is about 56 million, 56 million, million US dollars. US yeah. dollars. Yeah. Okay, so was there um, in a case where the engineer probably gave a span of how long will this building stay for? Yes, of course, the building started, but well, the MOU was signed in 2012 and the construction proper started in 2015. But as we all know, the country was struck by Ebola, mm -hmm. which um, really was a big challenge. That was where the delay came and you know, there were lots of, so many things came to a standstill. Mm -hmm. So with that, you know, the time has to be expanded. And that is why we are about, it's only now we are finishing the building. The building. So, yeah. And how, what's the warranty for the building? How long uh, will this building be there for? Well, of course, it has to be there for life. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, it's one of the biggest buildings in Sri Lanka, not only in Freetown. And it's a multi-purpose building. Though it's an administrative building, but we are also looking at service delivery, you know. Um, even as we are transforming Freetown, we want to see how we can transform Freetown with facilities around, mm -hmm. not only for us, for, for the Freetown City Council, but also for people out there, for the Freetonians as well. Mm -hmm. So we have various services um, in terms of, um, like what we saw just now, car parks, we have about yeah. a multi-purpose car park, about 100 um, oh. car parking spaces, okay. and also we have a restaurant Will the public have access to this? Of course, at least for and the Fritonians. Will, will the there be a cost per se? And what, what are the ranges of cost for parking? Well, after the model of the financial model has been set, we will let the public know. We will communicate to the public what it costs. Mm -hmm. And I just want to use this opportunity to tell, to let the Fritonians know the facilities they have in the building. We also have a restaurant there, okay. you know, and there is a sky lounge where you can relax. Mm -hmm. And we also have an auditorium. That has about 500 capacity, sitting capacity. Okay. Um, there is a conference room, of course. There is a hall where you can, you know, hold your events if you want to. And we have other places, other, 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 other flats of uh, buildings to to let, you know, which very soon we advertise. advertise. Yeah. Okay, so there might be a question. When you said uh, the parking space will be open to free tokens, is it going to be supposedly for private vehicles or even commercial vehicles also? Well, what about an um, instance where probably someone doesn't have a private vehicle but had to charter a taxi and probably want to use that parking space? Will they be allowed? Well, looking at the building, you know that it's not a place for like a taxi park or mm -hmm. keke park or ukada park, definitely. <laughs> but we see the constraints of... Um, um, people going to work and having, I mean, the, the, the constraints of um, parking their cars. Those are the instances you are watching, uh, apart from Freedom City Council, because I'm um, looking at the number of staff we have, mm -hmm. and I believe we have to ensure that we reserve space for people that may also want to, want yeah, because you're using it for also to, to generate revenue for the council. That was the public relations of Fees African City Council, Koma Hassan Kamara. The most anticipated need of citizens to own a national identification card will soon become a reality. This was disclosed by the Director General of the National Civil Registration Authority, Mohamed Masakon, on the ongoing procurement of equipment for the printing of the identification cards. The DG was addressing participants on the discussions on the conflicting and overlapping legislation and gaps within the NCRA Act of 2016. Emmanuel Arthur, similar part of the meeting. National identification card is one of the burning need of citizens, especially for those who frequently travel within the sub-region. Its demand is high because it identifies one as a citizen of the country and also enables one to do any transaction within the country. Understanding that procurement for the equipment that will enable the production of both the national and equus identification card is underway 
is indeed welcoming for citizens. The procurement process now fully to produce national identity cards as well as ECOWAS compliant ID cards. We have personal identity cards for our folks. Citizens and other residents in Sierra Leone, and then we have ECOWAS ID cards for, on demand because ECOWAS ID cards are used so people who want to travel to the sub region and they can travel without passport. He said they are now in advanced stage in terms of the procurement process, adding that as a government they will support the process. He assured the public that they are working towards decentralizing the issuing of ID cards. The meeting with stakeholders on NCRA Act of 2016 was as a result of recommendations from experts on the conflicting legislations within the Act due to series of assessment done. Legal consultant of the National Civil Registration Authority, Emmanuel Safa Abdullah, in a PowerPoint presentation, exposed the lacuna in the current Act of NCRA citing the lack of an integrated civil registration system in the country, among others. Sierra Leone has not drafted an integrated civil registration system, he further pointed out. A number of issues has been identified relating to the law that establishes the NCRA. Emmanuel Alfred Samoa, SLBC Freetown. In a bid to strengthen the health sector, the government through the Ministry of Health and Sanitation has provided equipment to the Salon Psychiatric Hospital in Kise. According to the Minister of Health and Sanitation, Professor Alpha Rui, the items which included medicines, protective gears and hand washing facilities were to aid the administration of the hospital. I mean, the forefront was there. The Sierra Leone Psychiatric Hospital, located in Eastern Freetown, was established many years ago mainly for patients with mental disorders. Since then, many citizens who are faced with mental challenges have been referred to the hospital for treatment. Previously, the hospital was faced with many challenges which ranged from insufficient staff to dilapidated structures and lack of medical equipment for an effective functioning of the hospital. President Bio earlier this year visited the hospital and pledged to maintain its facilities and provide them with needed items. To fulfill his promise, the items were officially handed over to the hospital by the health minister. Can you now just imagine what has been the mental consequences of the people of this country? Think of those we call child soldiers in 1991. These are adults with us today. We talk about increased rape, we talk about increased um, um, gender violence, but we've never addressed the mental state of our people through all these, these consequences that we have experienced. On receiving the equipment, the head psychiatrist at the hospital, Dr. Abdul Jalo, thanked the government for their support and said the items were timely and very important for the operation of the hospital. He recalled that previously they were faced with shortage of equipment which made their work ineffective. It was hard, it was difficult, it was frustrating before because this hospital was created for, for four decades. But thank God, within these two years, things have changed. Of course, we need them and we are going to probably use them. Because as you heard from the I'm a, I'm a director of hospitals, this hospital is, it is one of the most clean hospitals in Sierra Leone for now. So it means we have to work harder to continue to maintain that standard so that we can have an effective mental health care for our patients. Dr. Jalo continued that one among several challenges faced at the hospital was the abandonment of patients by their relatives. Many would bring their relatives to the hospital for treatment and later abandon them at the hospital. And some of them were stigmatized in their communities after their medication. He called on all, especially traditional healers, to ensure the hospitalized people with mental illness as they can only be cured when treated medically. SLBC News, Aminata Fufana. 
The Governance and Leadership Society at the Institute of Public Administration Management, IPAM, has held a one-day symposium for students on the topic principles of good governance in enhancing sustainable national development. The theme was specifically designed to support students on the principles of good and effective governance and strengthening the student leadership at all levels. Let's join James and Tuna for more on the report. The university is seen as a platform that shapes the skills of will be leaders of a country. The symposium was to broaden the horizon of the students, especially on how to make them become better leaders. President Governance and Leadership Society, Momo Flea, pointed out the symposium gears towards sharing of knowledge among student leaders at IPAM on the approaches of building strong institutions. What the aims and objectives of your society or organization is for? And as policy students, um, trying to be a very good uh, policy analyst and um, somebody that I believe that administratively we have to contribute to, to national development, going to the fact of uh, the 2015 um, Sustainable Development Conference that will help ensure that we achieve the Sustainable Development Goals in 2030 and um, that of 63. I thought is that. Um, it is not a matter of waiting on that day, but it's a matter, it's a process. Sustainable development is a process of having a long-term goal. So it has to start with, with us on campus. Deputy Vice Chancellor of IPAM, Professor Samuel Edmond Nuni, said leadership is not about glorious crowning acts, but it's about keeping one steam focus on a goal and motivate to do more. You may well find out that there is a lot that you know which have been picked up from conversations with your friends in informal settings quite outside the classroom. Usually, the second teacher, the second set of lecturers in the university, for you to have a balanced university education, are symposia. here like this. Deputy Commissioner and National Youth Commission Emma Sinkamara said when students understand the principles of good governance and leadership they will make informed decisions when they are in place in position of trust in future. The behavior of people are, are changed if you don't try to win hearts and minds and change mindsets within the public sector and, and help transform people from, from trying to amass wealth for themselves and trying to optimize public good, then, then you will not achieve anything else. Other speakers, we are impressed with the cordial. Other speakers, we are impressed with the cordial relationship between the governance and the leadership society and other departmental societies within and outside the Institutes of Public Administration and Management. For SLBC News, Jonathan Turner reporting. Now, as little banking and financial transactions are the order of the day, Orange, Sardion and Ecobank have launched the Orange Money Bank to Wallet Service. Arona Patrick Maher reports. The Orange Money Bank to Wallet Service partnership with Ecobank is to make easy financial transactions, especially in the regions. Bank to Wallet is a mobile money service that allows subscribers to withdraw and deposit cash into their bank accounts through their Orange Money wallets. For one to be part of the EcoBank Orange Money Wallet, a customer must have an EcoBank account and a SIM card activated on Orange Money with full details. Chief Executive Officer Orange Money, David Masari, said Orange Money has made life of Sierra Leoneans easy by making money transactions easy, especially in the region. He said Orange Money partnership with EcoBank will help people open an EcoBank account in any part of the country, adding that it will allow customers to transfer from as low as 10,000 loans to 15 million loans per day to and from their bank accounts into their wallets. The managing director of EcoBank Sierra Leone, Annie Moore, said banking is not about where you go, but what you do, noting that with digital revolution, the financial aspect is key in taking the lead the reason they decided to partner with Orange Money. Said the EcoBank Orange Money wallet would help withdrawal from the bank easier and accessible as their aim is to ensure they have less people coming to the bank for money transactions. Launching the partnership, 
The board chairperson Orange Money, Amnata Kane, who doubles as the CEO Orange Sierra Leone, said they are pleased to partner with Ecobank in promoting digital money transaction and make access to money easier for the people. Orange, according to the CEO Orange Money, David Mansari, now has about 1 million active subscribers that are using Orange Money daily. Aruna Patrikuma, News Hour. The Sierra Nurses Association, in a bid to address native complaints against some of its members, has concluded a symposium with nurses in the charge of hospitals in the western area. The symposium was to find a solution to the problem and map up strategies for quality patient care with a view to salvage a threat that put the image of the noble profession in disrepute. Let's join Joseph Stanley for more. Healthcare problems in Freetown, among others, are moving. Mistreatment of patients, shortage of drugs in public health facilities, as well as patient population is far beyond the available staff. Recently, some nurses and paramedical staff turned down appeals to treat dying patients, a situation the president of the Sierra Leone Nurses Association, Betty Lemore, described as unacceptable. She disclosed that nurses are the largest workforce in the health sector and should be professional in carrying out their duties as they are dealing with lives. Um, we want to improve on nursing service delivery and we want to unify nursing in, in, within the country. As you, I know you are aware, so many trends have been happening in healthcare. Nurses are now being taken to court, they are taken to police and other things. And we want to see how we can reverse that strain to see us regain the face of nursing. Nurses, I want to let nurses know we have a role to play. And one key role we have to play is to improve healthcare service delivery. We are there to improve care to patients and not to implement fear to patients. So we want to come back to the drawing board and discuss what have changed and see how we can address the change. Betty Lemo informed nurses that they have major role to play for patient care and encourage them not to relent in their stride for excellence, especially in the fight against COVID-19. She advised nurses to respect their clients at all times, stressing the need for them to have passion for their job as they are dealing with lives that is not for sale. The president of the Nurses Association encouraged her colleagues to go as manager and mentor in their respective health facilities to enhance quality health outcomes, especially for women and children. Senior Human Resource Officer and Minister of Health and Sanitation John Conte said nurses are accountable to the public and the ministry to promote professional code of practice, conduct and ethics in their various duty stations. I must note that the Ministry of Health is standing alone, that we are not civil servants. No, we are civil servants. We are governed by these regulations and rules. That is why the appointment is not coming from the Ministry of Health, does it? It's coming from the Director General of Human Resources Management Office, not so? Alright, that's to tell you that you are governed by this rule. He said Nurses Code of Ethics is a relevant document that will help them make the right decision and more comfortably better serve the patients. The Registrar of the Nurses and Midwives Board, Christiana Masali, encouraged the nurses to disseminate the knowledge gain to their junior colleagues as nurses should take leadership role in their place of work. She expressed dismay over the negative behavior of some nurses as much is expected from them, adding that those found wanting will have their license withdrawn. Movement for Youth and Children's Rights Organization has launched Youth and Police Community Club in Watlow. The group helped reduce the incidence of violence in that part of the country. Director of Movement for Youth and Children's Rights Organization, Mada Makovere, said building the Sierra will want starts with a voice of free society, nothing that a brighter future for a Sierra Leone rests with the youth. Let's join Jeta Turner again. Lawlessness has been acknowledged to be very much alive across the country, especially in the Waterloo community. Many say it is a safe haven for criminals. 
desensitization by movements for youth and children's rights organization was born out of the organization's desire to disabuse the minds of youth from violence and criminality. Madam Makavoy, director, Movements for Youth and Children's Rights Organizations, believes it is time to have a paradigm shift in the way the Sidonian youth thinks and acts, call on them to take responsibility towards personal and national development, stressing that the youths are both the present and the future. Because it is only these that we can experience peace and development. Because development starts with peace. Without peace and tranquility, we can't talk about development. So as an institution, we are movement for youth and children's rights. So we believe that young people have the right, the right to peace, the right to live in a sustainable society. But one of the primary things is peace. And these are the two people right now. And we don't want a re re recurrence of the war. We've, we have experienced the, the, the brutality war that caused a lot of um, atrocities in this nation. So we want a society that is peaceful, a society that is full of hope, tranquility, justice. Member of the Watamu community, we are impressed with the Movement for Youth and Children's Rights Organizations initiative and promise that with this approach, they will maintain the peace in their communities. For SBC News, Jonathan Turner reporting. Meanwhile, a distress letter written by the husband of a pregnant woman to the Ministry of Health and Sanitation and the Human Rights Commission regarding alleged negligence which led to the miscarriage of his wife at the Cooper Government Hospital on the 21st of May 2020 has been making rounds on social media and has attracted the attention of the public. According to the company, the attitude and negligence of some nurses and ambulance drivers led to his wife's miscarriage. Emmanuel Alfred Samura has been following the story. When a baby is born, parents love to send around pictures of their newborn. It is one of the things parents are fond of doing, especially when the baby is perfection personified. But who wants to be sending pictures of a dead baby? I was so mad and so sad and frustrated. And up to now, I'm the saddest guy here. I don't think, I don't think there's, there's anybody that is so frustrated like me about this country. Because people are trying to make things better. But it's not working Nasiu said the severity of his wife's condition when he got to the community health center made her to be transferred. He said at the Gukupa government hospital, his wife was scanned and was then told she had placenta previa 2 centimeters and that she was bleeding. He said his wife emerged for three days at the Gukupa government hospital and was not well taken care of by even the nurses before she was later transferred to PCMH where she was operated on the fourth day and unlucky for them they lost the baby. As he saw, he came back to the Cooper government hospital to inform them that because of their lack of care for his wife, their dream of having a baby was aborted. Nasir said he felt bad because even the Ministry of Health did not respond to the many complaints he made on the negligence of the hospital that caused the life of his child. Ministry of Health said they reacted upon receiving the complaint from Nasir but did not make it known to him. I had wanted to take an action, but all the same, immediately I heard that one. I straight away wrote a letter to the medical superintendent to explain in writing full details. Jay's clinic is the mother and child health aid clinic at Gokel where Fatima Tashaif used to go for antenatal care. Medical record of Fatima Tashaif at the clinic showed that she never missed her antenatal appointment and was responding to treatment. On the 24th of May, records also show that Fatma Tashaif was transferred because of the severity of her condition, which the clinic said was beyond their control. They disclosed that the patient also had underlying health issues, which they failed to expose because of patient confidentiality. Management at the Rokupa Government Hospital off camera told SLBC that the patient arrived at exactly 1 p.m. on the 24th of May. Upon arrival, Fatmata was scanned and the result came out to be placenta previa 2 cm. They told the husband that the survival of the child is 
looking at the mother's condition and the age of the pregnancy which was premature for delivery. They continued that when she came, she had a pad on and there were only drops of blood on the pad which made them to put her on bed rest to observe her condition, expecting the bleeding to subside. In the morning of the 25th May, which was the second day, the woman was examined. They said there was no sign or drop of blood on the woman. On the 26th May, which was the third day in the morning, the woman was checked and was okay without any bleeding. Shockingly, at around 10 p.m., the woman started bleeding and the anesthetist who was on duty was sick and the other was unable to make it early because of the curfew. So they had an in-house agreement to transfer the woman to PCMH for emergency operation. Shockingly, they said they were there when Masih came accusing them after the operation that they killed his baby. They said as professionals, looking at the depressed state of the man, they consoled and apologized to him about his loss, but said Nasi got agitated and promised to take legal action against them even when they had apologized for something they did not do. The agitation and frustration of Nasi when he lost his child was because the child was the first and was badly in need of one and has already shopped more than two boxes of cloth for the said baby. Emmanuel Alfred Samoa, SLBC Freetown. High Court Judge Justice John Bosco Aliyu has acquitted and discharged Mohamed Lamigmar alias Cook NG and Paul Khan, who is standing trial for allegedly murdering a 19 year old commercial sex worker, Hannah Bakre. They were acquitted and discharged after the 11 member jury returned a no guilty verdict for both accused of the two count charge. Hannah Bakre was found dead, half naked, with her pants on one leg and abandoned along the Aberdeen Beach in August 2016. Reports. One could see the relief, anxiety and sense of freedom on the faces of both accused when the judge acquitted and discharged them and the first acquitted and discharged person, Mohamed Lamin Kamara, offered one raka of Muslim prayer in the dock. Relatives and friends of the former accused persons shouted in the court's room in celebration of the freedom of the accused persons. Among the people that went to support the acquitted and discharged persons was one of the country's biggest and hottest rappers, L.A.J. It is over four years now since the murder of Hannah Bokari at Habadi in Freetown, and both acquitted and discharged persons were seized and have been behind bars ever since their arrest in August 2016. But finally, they have returned to the world when judgment was passed in their favor on Thursday, 5th November 2020. The matter was stuck at the High Court due to lack of cooperation from the panel of jurors who were empaneled as judges of fact in the matter, which made the judge dissolve the previous panel of jurors. In the interest of justice and fair tale in the matter, Justice John Bosco and he ordered for a fresh panel to be set up that resulted to the swift and speedy conclusion in the matter. In his summing up, Justice Aliu said for both accused to be found guilty for the offense of murder, the prosecution must establish it was the accused that murdered Hannah Bokari and that the victim Hannah must have died within a year and a day. According to the judge, prosecution witness one, a police officer, Sylvester Shekukoma, told the court the second accused, Pokon, assisted him with a rapper to cover Hannah's private part when she was found half naked at the beach, adding that first accused, Mohamed Lamin Kamara, gave him a telephone call to inform his bosses when he ran out of credit. The police witness mentioned both accused told him they were not aware about Anna Bokari's corpse that was lying on the beach. The judge said the police witness further said the matter was reported to him by one man about a corpse at the Abadin beach and when he went there he discovered a female corpse that was half naked with her pants on one leg. While making reference to the pathologist reports, Justice John Bosqualiu said Hannah Bokari died of manual strangulation. He however cautioned the jury to do their work judiciously and ensure that as judges of fact they should return with their unanimous right verdict based on evidence adduced in court. 
The judge concluded that there was no direct evidence in the matter and urged the jury to do justice in the murder matter. Defense counsel argued that both accused were innocent and that they did not conspire or murder Hannah Bokari. It could be recalled that Mohamed Lamin Kamara and Paul Korn were charged in court for the offenses of conspiracy and murder. It was alleged that Mohamed Lamin Kamara and Paul Korn murdered Hannah Bokari and disposed her remains along the Aberdeen Beach half naked on 13th August 2016. SLBC News, Amina Shinyande Ibrahima. Well, that's it. Well, views if you just tune in, you're watching news coming to you live from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, SLBC. It's now time for us to go for some news around the African continent. <laughs> And for news on African continent, Burkina Faso's President Rob Kabui has launched his re-election campaign promising to deal with the growing threat of Islamist militancy facing the country. He faulted his opponents for making the threat a campaign issue and that he's asking for five more years so that together they'll work for the security, stability, peace and resilience of the Burkina Bay people. He has been facing criticism over his handling of the Islamist insurgency, a threat that has spread across the Sahel region. The elections will be held on the 22nd of November. Two Liberians whose families escaped civil war in the 1990s and sought refuge in the U.S. have been elected to office in the state of Colorado and Rhode Island respectively. Naquita Risk won a seat in Colorado's House of Representatives, while high school principal Nathan Bia won a state seat in Rhode Island. The Ms. Risk said she would seek to ensure that whether you're a new immigrant or a fifth-generation Colorado, you're given an equal opportunity to succeed in life. Mr. Bia spent his childhood in Liberia's capital Monrovia when the Civil War broke out. He walked to the border with neighboring Ivory Coast before reuniting with his family in Rhode Island. And finally, for some news around the African continent, police in Uganda have warned opposition party, National Unity Platform, NUP, to adhere to the Ministry of Health and Sanitation guidelines in its planned manifesto launch. The presidential candidate Robert Kulayani, popularly known as Bobby Wine, is expected to lead the event in the western city of Barara on Saturday. Local police boss Abbas Yakaba said that his forces will not stand by to see NUP supporters disregard the standard operating procedures and the political campaigns and rallies women banned in the country. Bob Wine had run in with police on Tuesday as he presented his nomination papers for the elections. Dozens of his supporters who had escorted him were arrested and others injured after his party gas to disperse them. But well, that's it for some news around the African continent. If you just didn't still news are right here on the SLBC and please be reminded that you can watch us uh, watch our entertainment channel on channel thirty one on Nat um, Satcom and on channel one on the same Satcom. It's now time for us to go over for some entertainment news. Let's see what's happening in the entertainment world. Hello and welcome to Entertainment News. I am Cynthia Kama. Presently, we are here at Shangri-La, the sister eviction location, to look at the atmosphere. As we all know, its top roommates are up for eviction. We want to know whether their friends will accommodate this place as we are all set for Sunday's eviction. So join me as we tour the facility here at Shangri-La, Aberdeen. <laughs> As I told you earlier, we're here at the Shangri-La and we have the Managing Director. Welcome to Entertainment News. Thank you. Okay, so can you tell us how this place used to be when it's time for eviction? Well, normally, consider the past couple of Sundays, for example, Immediately you went outside, you see the moment on fans are how they are cheering, they are whatever person they are supporting, they, are, they come with different things out there 
talking, dancing, beating everywhere before they start coming in. Once also they are inside, normally also they also talk to them. Once they come in, they normally have friends who they also cheer with. They have their gumbes, whatever thing they come with to help to elevate whosoever they are in in this place. Okay, so what do you expect to see this Sunday? Because we have eight top roommates that are up for eviction. Do you think this place will accommodate all of us? Yes, for sure, because as of now, we are using outside here. We are also using some of these floors also. So we have, let me say, we have cameras that are also projecting upstairs for all those upstairs so that we can be able to see whatever thing they are they may doing downstairs here as well. Okay, so what type of people are upstairs? Because we can see up and down yeah, stairs. The VIPs or the VVIPs are normally upstairs. Oh, that was the manager of Shangri-La Mutai Bangura. Thank you for joining us. So now join me, let's continue the tour. Sister Salo, I tell you story. Sister, I'm in your money. Yeah. Big sister, Salon number one to tell you sister. May them vote for random love. It can be a minister, tell you sister. So here's a stage that they normally interview evicted roommates. So who knows what might happen this Sunday? Who might be the roommates that will be interviewed here? As we know, eight roommates are up for eviction. We'll find out soon. Here we normally use it for, as a car park, for example. Also, it depends on the number of people we are expecting. For example, we have a large number, we can also put projector screen there so that people can able to see from that other handle. Okay. This is the entrance for someone to come in. Okay, at that entrance, do they allow people to put chairs to sit? No. Stand here and you can see everything that is happening down there. Okay, so up, up there is VIP? Yes, this is yeah. So you can have a clear vision of everything that is going to happen. Okay. It's a nice view. Well, this is how we end the entertainment news. Don't forget, eight roommates are up for fiction. Keep voting. Goodbye. Many thanks to entertainment reporter Cynthia Kamara. It's now time for us to go for some sporting news. Hello and welcome to Sports Update on News Hour. In this edition, SLFA boss expressed delight over Sierra Leone's breathtaking performances in Liberia. Now, the Sierra Leone Football Association President Aisha Johansson has organized a dinner for Sierra Leone's male on the 17 and female on the 20 teams as a show of appreciation for their breathtaking performances in Liberia. The SLFA boss dined with players because of their breathtaking performances. SLBC Sports follows the story. A delegation which departed Sierra Leone for international friendlies in Liberia was greeted with delights by the Sierra Leone Football Association President and a Secretariat staff. A contingent of both the female on the 20 and the male U17 teams were highly impressive in Liberia. The Sierra Leone female on the 20 won two out of their three matches played in Liberia, while the male U17 won all three matches. Coaches and players from both teams were excited for the treat. She thanked the players and officials and registered her unconditional support to them and the growth of football in Sierra Leone. They don't care about that. It's about Sierra Leone, the pride of a nation. The pride of a nation. Everything. This is a family. We are a family. We want the winning all because these are competitions. We go for competitions to win. In every competition, there has to be a winner, there has to be a loser. Head of delegation, Ali Yubadara Tawali, 
said the under-17 male side is one of the best teams he had seen so far in the history of Sierra Leone football. Noting that the FA should make all his enable efforts to keep both the U-17 and that of the female under-20 together. This is a significant milestone. These players and officials will not forget in a hurry. Remarkable achievement for Sierra Leone youngsters, particularly the under-17 and that of the U-20 female side. Congratulations and continue the good work. With this, we nicely do this edition of Sports Updates to a close. I'm Abdul Kabir and thanks for watching. Many thanks to our sports correspondent Abdul Kabia with you. That's it. That's all we have time for in this edition of our local news right here on the SL. But before we draw down the curtains, finally, let's take a look at the top stories that made up the news for today. Freedom Skyline has the new Freetown City Hall administrative um, complex worth over 50 million United States dollars. National Civil Registration Authority has said it is in an advanced stage to commence on the issuance of national identification cards. And the Ministry of Health has provided medical equipment to the Serbian Psychiatric Hospital in Kisi. Two men have been acquitted in the murder trial of the 19-year-old Anna Bakri. The 19-year-old was a sex worker who was a sex worker was murdered around the Aberdeen Beach in August 2016. Well, that's it. That's how we draw down the curtains on today's news broadcast. Many thanks to you for watching. I have been your presenter, Anna Masila Singh. Bye-bye. Enjoy the rest of your evening and do have a lovely weekend. Continue watching the SLBC. Bye.